Hi, my name is Stephanie Meller. I'm a postdoc at UCL, and today I'm going to be talking about the analysis of optically pumped magnetometer, or OPM, data. So in terms of the contents of the talk, first I'm going to ask, well, why use OPMs in the first place? Then how does an OPM work? And finally, what does that mean for data analysis? But if there's one message that I'd like you to take away from today's talk, it's that the existing SPM MEG functions are still completely valid. We just need to think about how we apply them slightly differently. So I'm sure most of you, well, you're at the MEG EEG SPM course, so I imagine you're very aware of a cryogenic MEG scanner that looks a little bit like this one. I often compare it to looking a bit like a big sort of hair dryer, a hair dryer that you might see at a hairdresser's. In reality, though, a better comparison might be a vacuum flask, because really it's a big dewer designed to hold this liquid helium. And within that liquid helium, you find these squids, which are the, the actual magnetic sensors um, that record the magnetic fields. And these squids have to be kept extremely cold at about four degrees Kelvin. So that's about four degrees higher than four degrees Celsius higher than the absolute coldest than anything can be. IPMs, by comparison, are small and self-contained. They're also magnetic sensors, um, but unlike squids, you can hold them directly on your hand. And and the fact that they're small and self-contained means that they can be placed directly on the head in a helmet that's slimmer and more wearable than the cryogenic MEG system. And this wearability has a few advantages. So firstly, simply by bringing the sensors closer to the scalp, we can get higher signal. Because the squids have to be so cold, there's a certain amount of insulation needed between the head and the squid system. And for an adult head, that can be around three centimeters but the magnetic field from the brain decreases as the square of the distance between the source within the brain and the sensors. So this blue line here, that represents a, this relationship for a magnetometer. So that's the sensor like our, like our OPMs uh, and some squids, uh, and some cryogenic MEG squid systems. Uh, while this orange line is, is for a gradiometer that might be seen in a cryogenic squid system. So if we take a source in the brain that in our squid system is about six centimeters from the sensors, then bring the sensors directly onto the scalp. Simply by losing that bit of insulation, the sensors are about three centimeters closer to the source. And that equates to an increase in signal of about a factor of four. What you might notice is that because this relationship isn't linear, the increase in signal that you get is dependent on the, dis is dependent on the position of the source within the brain. So if I take a source that's about nine centimeters from the squid sensors and then move the sensors directly onto the scalp, losing that three centimeters again takes us down to six centimeters, but the increase in signal now is only about two times. So what you'll find is that how much signal you gain depends on where you're looking in the brain. So you'll see the biggest increases for the most superficial sources and the smallest increases, still an increase, but a smaller one for deeper sources within the brain. The other bit of nuance to consider is that we'll see much larger improvements for children, simply because their heads are smaller. And so the actual increase in distance between the source in the brain and the sensors will be much bigger for them by bringing the sensors onto the scalp. An additional advantage of wearability is that you get higher spatial information. So if this is the sort of topography that we might see in our, in our squid system, if we brought the sensors onto the scalp, what we see looks effectively much, much tighter, as well as seeing the signal increase going from four femtotesla to 40 femtotesla, the peaks in the topography have become much more peaky. Alternatively expressed, you can look at the number of components required to model the signal that you're seeing. So here you've got uh, three lines. The yellow line represents EEG, the orange one is off scalp or squid MEG, and the blue line is your on scalp or OPM MEG. And along the x-axis, you have the number of components in effectively a model of the signal. And along the y-axis, you have the variance that's explained by that model. And you can see you need a lot more components to explain the same amount of variance in on-scalp MEG than you do for off-scalp MEG or EEG, simply because there's more information in the signal that needs to be explained. Another argument for using OPMs is that the sensors can be placed really flexibly. Sometimes this is done in order to get high, uh, high sensor coverage in a particular region of the head or to look at a particular region of the brain. In this case, they've used some sensors on the head and some on the back 
in order to concurrently look at signals from the brain and the spinal cord. And this means that really for the first time in MEG, we can look at the relationship between the spinal cord and the brain. Additionally, you might choose to use OPMs because of space requirements. So this helium duo takes up quite a lot of room. A cryogenic MEG room can be just over three meters by four meters in footprint. Alternatively though, because the OPMs are very small and can be placed on the head, you can imagine a system that looks more like an MRI scanner that a person lies down in and takes up much less room. Alternatively, you can build a similar looking uh, magnetically shielded room to um, a cryogenic system, but one that's much smaller in space. So this one takes up only 1.3 by 1.3 meters. Another big advantage of using OPMs is that while well, having a wearable system means that the sensors move with the head. So movement can be much better tolerated than within a squid system. So here's an example in which on the left, Gareth is looking straight ahead and on the right, he's moving his head around. But in both, in both scenarios, he is pressing a button with his right hand. And along the bottom, you can see the evoked response to the button press. And despite that head movement, the evoked response appears very similar. Here are some other examples of movement-based experiments. So for example, looking at learning to play, well, in this case, a ukulele, but play an instrument um, using VR, dancing in the room, or even recording from patients while they're having a seizure. So moving on to the second section, how does an OPM work? Well, fundamentally, it's really just three components. A laser, a gas, in our case, we use rubidium 87 sensors, and a photodiode, which is just a device that measures how much light reaches it and outputs that as a voltage. So the purpose of the laser is to push the rubidium into a higher energy state where the spin of the atoms is aligned. So you can think of all of the rubidium atoms as having a, a spin, a direction. And naturally, they're all uh, randomly distributed. But when the laser shines through the gas, it can push the atoms into a particular direction. And so what the laser is really doing is that it's giving energy to the gas while it pumps it into this higher state. But once everything's aligned, there's nothing left for the laser to do. So the gas is transparent to it and the maximum amount of laser light reaches the photodiode. Now, a magnetic field transverse to the laser, however, will knock the atoms out of this energy state. It effectively perturbs them. And so suddenly the laser is able to do work, give energy to the gas again, in order to bring them back to this higher energy state. But that's using up energy from the laser, and so less laser-like light makes it to the photodiode. So what that means, if you look at the photodiode output, this, this voltage on the y-axis of this graph, is that when you've got zero magnetic field, the maximum amount of light is reaching the photodiode. So you get the maximum voltage output. But when there's a transverse magnetic field, that's what's shown along the x-axis here, as that field increases, you're seeing less light at the photodiode. And so you can infer the magnetic field from the voltage output. And what we really want for this to be a very, a very sensitive sensor um, is for this peak to be as tight as possible. Because in that case, even for a very small magnetic field change, and bear in mind that the x-axis here is looking at nanotesla, but the fields that we're expecting from the brain are um, at most a thousand times smaller than that, if not hundreds of thousands. If we can make this, this peak really tight, even for a very small change in magnetic field, we're still seeing an observable change in voltage. And so in order to do that, we need to enter what's called the spin exchange relaxation free or SURF regime. So to try to explain what that is, um, consider I've got two rubidium atoms and they're nicely aligned pointing in one direction. Then I apply a magnetic field transverse or orthogonal to those atoms. They begin processing around this magnetic field and bear in mind, of course, this is a gas, so they're moving around all the time. And at some point, because they're moving, they're going to collide. And when they collide, they relax. And so there's no net polarization as a result of this magnetic field anymore. And the problem with that is that, well, in effect, that's work that otherwise the laser would have done. So by relaxing, there's less for the laser to do, and there's less change in, um, in voltage from the photodiode for the magnetic field. Expressed as a figure, you can see that same figure that we saw before, except looking at uh, this blue line, 
that's expressing what would happen if we have a very short relaxation time of the gas. So if it uh, relaxes very quickly on its own, the laser is not really having to do anything. Alternatively, if you have a very long relaxation time and any relaxation that's happening has to be due to the laser, we get this much tighter orange curve. And for here, and here we have a much bigger change in voltage for the same change in magnetic field. So we have a much more sensitive sensor. So in order to achieve that long relaxation time, and bear with me because this will seem a little counterintuitive to start with, the first thing we have to do is to increase the number of collisions. And so we do that by increasing the density of the gas and by increasing the temperature. So those atoms that are there move around much faster. We also reduce the magnetic field because that increases the time for atomic precession. And so the combination of having more collisions and a slower precession speed means that there are more collisions per precession. And then in one precession, there's effectively no net polarization change. So how does an OPM work? Well, this surf regime sets some of the conditions for how we run our OPM system. So we need a dense gas at a high temperature and zero or extremely low magnetic field. The final part of how an OPM works is that we need a way of getting the direction of the magnetic field as well as its amplitude. So at the moment, say I recorded a voltage at this point here. I wouldn't know if that corresponded to a field of approximately minus 10 nanotesla or a field of 10 nanotesla. And that's not very helpful really um, when we need to know whether something is going in or out of the head. So the final thing we do is to apply an oscillating electric field around the gas, which effectively differentiates this curve so that we can infer the direction of the magnetic field from the photodiode output, so long as we're working in this range before these turning points. And so now if I've got a field of minus 10 nanotesla, I can tell that it's minus 10 and not 10 nanotesla purely from the voltage. So what you might notice is that this curve is not totally linear. Not only do we have these, these turning points, after which, again, we're getting the same problem of having two magnetic fields corresponding to the same voltage, but also even in this middle region, the, even in this middle region, the voltage that you see as a, as a function of magnetic field doesn't appear to be completely straight. And we can express that mathematically with the OPM signal equation. So if everything were perfectly linear, and this is sort of the equation that we'd use for a squid system, this is really the equation that you'd see. Y here is your, your output, your voltage from your photodiode. Omega Z is the signal that you're interested in, and K is just some constant. But in reality, for the OPMs, this is a more accurate signal equation. So you've still got this signal of interest on the top, but you've also got this nonlinearity term that, again, you see this omega z value in, that is, so it's dependent on the magnetic field that you're recording. And that means that, okay, within this very small field range close to zero, your sensor is approximately linear, but as the, the signal that you're recording increases, the gain in the sensor becomes increasingly inaccurate. So the higher the signal, the further away you are from linearity. Often people will stop there, but technically the OPM signal equation is an infinite series. And this is the next term. This is re responsible for what you might hear called cross-axis projection errors or CAPE. And so here, if omega Z is the magnetic field along the Z axis of the sensor, and that's what we're interested in. Omega X and omega Y are the signals, sorry, omega X and omega Y are the magnetic fields on the axes perpendicular to that. So if, using my right hand, if Z is the, the Z axis, I'm looking at the magnetic field going this way. What I'm actually seeing is that what I'm recording is also dependent on the magnetic field going, well, perpendicular to it, going along X and going along Y. And so if you plot that out, okay, BZ is on the, the Y axis of this, of this figure, and BZ is constant. But if I'm changing the field along the sensor's y-axis, confusingly on the x-axis of this graph, then you're still seeing a change in bz, even though it hasn't actually changed. So how do we put people get around these problems, nonlinearity and CAPE? Well, firstly, OPMEG or OPM-MEG is performed in a low field environment. 
So this can mean passive magnetic shielding, like this magnetically shielded room. This is a photo of our one at UCL, which has been specifically designed to keep the low frequency magnetic field as small as possible in order for it to be used with OPMs. But it can also mean active mag magnetic shielding. So here are just, just a few examples of where people have used electromagnetic coils with currents optimized to create a magnetic field equal and opposite to the background magnetic field in the center of the coils. So that effectively cancels out that remnant magnetic field. Additionally, more and more people are working with what are called closed loop OPM systems. And so this uses the same idea of active magnetic shielding, except rather than canceling out the field in the entire space, it's canceling it out just at the OPM sensor. And these generally run in, in real time. So the magnetic field is recorded by the sensor and then fed back to the coils on the sensor in order to cancel it out. The latest field line and Q-spin OPMs, so those are the two biggest OPM manufacturers for MEG, both their latest systems use this kind of closed loop design. And this video on the right is an example of an experiment we did at, at UCL, where the participant moved around the room and while they were moving in one condition, this, this feedback off case, um, we didn't do anything. Uh, we let the sensors run and you can see that they frequently saturate the field. The magnetic field becomes too big and the sensors can't record anymore. In this feedback on condition though, we implemented this kind of closed loop system where we fed back the field that we were recording to the sensors on, to the coils on board the sensors. And you can see that suddenly the system is staying in range much more of the recording and so we're able to use more of the data that we get. One of the advantages of this kind of feedback system is that it can be used to create an OPM with a higher bandwidth and so by that I mean it can be used to make the sensor more sensitive to higher frequency signals because one of the disadvantages of OPMs by comparison to squids is that they're less sensitive to high frequency signals above around 150 hertz. So here's an example of a fairly early closed loop system where by implementing this closed loop mode, they were able to increase their bandwidth up to 195 Hertz. However, the bandwidth and frankly, many of the OPM properties are quite dependent on the sensor. And so up until now, I've really spoken about rubidium or alkali surf OPMs, but there are actually quite a range of different designs out there. So here are just a very few examples. In a way, the most similar to these alkali surf OPMs are the helium-4 OPMs uh, made by a company called mag for health These are still surf OPMs, but they use helium as the sensitive gas rather than rubidium. And that has a couple of advantages. Um, firstly, it, in it increases the bandwidth considerably, so that's what this figure on the left is showing. And unlike the rubidium sensors, it doesn't need to be heated. So the rubidium sensors that we've talked about might have six millimetres or so of um, insulation in because they need to be heated. But the helium sensors can be placed directly on the scalp. And just by the same logic as moving the sensors from a squid system onto the scalp to gain some signal in your OPM system, you can gain a little bit more signal again by being able to take the sensitive region, the gas, absolutely onto the scalp. Additionally, these uh, helium OPMs work in much higher background magnetic fields. So the rubidium sensors I've been talking about tend to operate best in fields up to about 8 nanotesla. These helium sensors can work into fields, in fields up to about 200 nanotesla. But if they're sounding too good to be true, it is worth noting that they do have a higher noise floor than the rubidium OPMs. So the second example on here is an NMOR, or Nuclear Magneto Optical Rotation Sensor, which again is designed to work in higher background magnetic fields. They work on a slightly different principle than a surf magnetometer, but because of this bias field across the sensitive region, they're able to withstand or be robust to changes in external magnetic fields that other sensors might struggle with. So to give you a bit of context, this sensor was designed to be used in a magnetically shielded room, which also contained an elector cryogenic, which also contained an elector cryogenic squid MEG system. And the elector system, the duo effectively contains a big magnet that's moving up and down, which meant that a rubidium sensor like the ones we talked about wasn't the most optimal solution. And then the final sensor that I've highlighted here is an unshielded one. So this is an auditory recording done with just a single sensor, but completely outside, completely unshielded, 
So without the magnetically shielded room or the external active magnetic shielding that we talked about previously. It required the participant to be aligned with the Earth's magnetic field, hence the slightly unusual angle of the photo, but I think it's a really exciting direction for the field. So then moving on to the final section, what does that mean for data analysis? Well, firstly, the M of OPM stands for magnetometer, and magnetometers pick up more background interference than gradiometers, simply because the idea of a gradiometer is that you record from two different positions and subtract one from the other. So the idea there being that the interference will be common across those two positions, and so will be subtracted when you take one away from the other. With a magnetometer, we don't get that same interference rejection. And so you might find that the noise spectrum looks slightly noisier than you perhaps are used to. You can see this one here that we recorded with our OPM system. Um, in the low frequencies, we get a lot of noise from drift and vibration. So for example, that could be a car going past outside, or in our old lab, it was the underground running underneath. And then there are peaks in the spectrum for line noise, as you might expect at 50 hertz, and then harmonics at 100 and 150. And then there are peaks from whatever equipment that we have in the room at the time. So in this case, there's a motion tracking camera, which records at 120 hertz, and for which we see a corresponding peak in the, in the noise spectrum. The really good news is that ICA, SSP, DSSP, temporal filtering and reference cancellation all still work. We just need to think about how we apply them. So we need to think about the number of channels because an OPM system may not have the same number of channels as a squid system. And a lot of these methods may rely on spatial oversampling. Additionally, is the noise source moving relative to the OPMs? So taking ICA as an example, which you might use to get rid of cardiac artifact. But if your head is moving relative to your heart or I'm turning my head around, then the cardiac artifact is going to change as the recording pro progresses. So you might not see the same ICA components that you're used to. You might see more or fewer, and they might change in time. Also, are the default settings appropriate? Taking temporal filtering as an example, if we've got a lot of low frequency noise from drift vibration movement, do we want to set a higher cutoff frequency than we normally would on the high pass filter? Something else to think about is that we'll see movement noise in the OPM data that we wouldn't have seen in the squid data because participants are able to move around now. That happens because the magnetic field is not constant in space. So say I do a recording over here and then I move my head over here, the magnetic field is going to be different in different positions. And that means we're going to see a field change in the OPM recordings. Rotations will also lead to field changes. So if you think I've got my OPM pointing forwards towards the screen and a magnetic field of, I don't know, three nanotesla pointing in the same direction. If I turn the sensor to the left by turning your head, suddenly the sensor's recording nothing because it's still sensitive in the direction that it's pointing and the magnetic field is still pointing straight forward. So you'll see a field change from that rotation of three nanotesla. Now, movement noise can be reduced post hoc but it is worth considering in the experimental design. Particularly, you don't generally want to be comparing two conditions where one contains a lot of movement and one contains very little. In a lot of ways, signal space separation or SSS should be the perfect method for getting rid of this kind of movement noise. SSS is a method frequently used in cryogenic MEG to separate external interference from the brain signal of interest. And this is done by modeling both the external interference and the internal brain signals with functions called spherical harmonics. And you can think of it as placing a sphere in between the brain and the sensors. And anything that comes from within that sphere is modeled as being from the brain. And anything that comes from outside of that sphere is modeled as being external interference and can be ignored. And so you only keep the model of the internal space. But this often isn't ideal for OPMs for a couple of reasons. Firstly, the channel number may be limited, and particularly the channel positions may not be optimal. But SSS is a, is a method that really relies on spatial oversampling. Over 
Additionally, the separation between the sensors and the scalp may not be spherical. So you may not be able to place this sphere in between the brain and the sensors anymore, simply because most people's brains aren't spherically shaped. Most people's heads are elongated. And so if you try to place, place the sphere, you'll end up either including some sensors in the sphere or placing or skipping out regions of the brain. So how have people tried to overcome these issues? Well, on the left here is an example of a paper where they've optimized the origin of the SSS coordinate system and the number of parameters used to model the internal and external spaces in order to gain a stable solution for an OPM system. On the right is an alternative solution where they've iteratively updated the weighting of the different model components for the internal and external spaces, again, in order to achieve um, a stable solution. So particularly, I just want to highlight, if you look at figure B here, this is the internal space. So this, this blue line is the true brain signal. The orange line is the iterative SSS solution. But the yellow line is this SSS solution without any optimization for OPMs. And you can see quite how unstable it really is. But the main solution I want to highlight today is what's called adaptive multiple modeling or AMM. This was developed by Tim Tierney here, here at UCL. And as this is the SPM course, I want to highlight that it is available in the latest version of SPM available on GitHub. And Tim's made two changes to the sort of traditional SSS model. Firstly, he's orthogonalized the internal and external spaces. So this stops the external interference leaking into the internal space and leading to that kind of unstable solution. It's also changed the coordinates from being spherical to spheroidal which effectively fits people's brains better. So where before you couldn't fit that sphere in in between the brain and the sensors anymore, you can now fit a spheroid. Just to show how effective AMM can really be, this is data from a participant watching a flickering checkerboard. And it's flickering at four hertz. On the left, you can see the filtered signal. So that's temporal filtering only without any spatial filtering from SSS or AMM. And you can see that there is a signal and it appears to be a visual one, but it is somewhat noisy. By comparison in the middle, you can see the same filtered signal after the application of TSSS. And clearly TSSS is introducing a lot of noise and instability. And that signal that you've seen before has kind of disappeared. On the right though, you can see the solution from AMM and you do see a very clear four Hertz oscillation, much cleaner than either of the other two. And the topography does indicate that the signal is coming from the visual region of the brain. You might also see homogeneous field correction or HFC talked about. So this is related to AMM and SSS in that it still models the external space, but rather than modeling both the internal and external spaces and keeping the internal space, in HFC, you only model the external space and then regress that out of the data. And at least in its original form, the H, the homogeneous part, means that the field is the same across the brain. So for every position, it's defined by three components, Bx, By, and Bz. This is more conservative than AMM. If you have enough sensors, we'd generally recommend AMM. But if you don't have the sensor number required for the spatial modeling of AMM, HFC can be a really successful alternative. So to conclude, firstly, we talked about why use OPMs for MEG at all. And really the advantages come from being able to get rid of that cryogenic dewer, because it means we can create a system that is wearable, so we get maximum signal for any head size, higher spatial information, and a system that is much more movement tolerant because the sensors move with the brain. Additionally, the sensors can be placed flexibly, so we're no longer restricted to this um, head-shaped dewer that we had before. And it means you can have a smaller footprint so it can, your lab can take up less space because there's no need to store the liquid helium anymore. How does an OPM work? Well, if there's one conclusion to take away from this, this section, then it's that the surf OPMs that we've really talked about need a low magnetic field environment in order to work at their best. And lastly, what does that mean for data analysis? Well, the main conclusion is that the existing MEEG functions are still completely valid. We just need to think about how we apply them. And so that means considering the number of channels that we have in our system and the degree of movement in the recording. With that, I'm going to leave it there. But if you'd like to learn more about OPM data analysis, 
I would recommend the OPM data analysis demo that's a part of this course. But I'd like to finish by thanking you for your attention and for listening, and I'm happy to take any questions. <laughs>